So hello everyone, I'm Mercedes Lopez Arratia, I work for Banamex, it's Citibank in Mexico. I now have the, the retail bank marketing, but uh, till three or four months ago I used to uh, run digital for, for the bank. So I have the pleasure to introduce um, Steve Simpson, who is the AVP of Global Strategy and Analytics for Starcom MediaVest, and then, oh sorry. And then Neil Joyce, the SVP and Managing Director for EMEA in Signal. And Brian Sabin, National Lead for Programmatic Strategy in Digitas LBI. So um, they are going to be talking for 10 minutes each on the or each group for, for um, their experiences on data activation. And then we will have some time for questions and answers. So get ready. So let's go, guys. Morning. Is the other way around? Shall we switch? I think that'd be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> quick, quick. We are quick. Problems, problem solvers. So good. Thank you. Hey, it's uh, great to be in Andreas's private man cave here. This is where all binge watching of Netflix takes place in Andreas's house. Um, yeah, I was here at the weekend watching Breaking Bad Series 6 with Andres. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, location. So fundamentally, I think we picked up on this on the previous uh, session, is we should be thinking less about activating data and thinking more about activating people, because actually marketing is really about people, right? And when we think about traditional marketing, and I, I make this simple chart just to make it... Um, easy for people to understand, and I certainly don't want to dumb down this very important subject. But fundamentally, when we think about marketing, we start with people. We start with business challenges, we start with people, we think about the behavior that we want from people, and then we spend a lot of time thinking about the people that we want to change that behavior for. Yet when we end up planning our marketing and then creating our marketing plans and activating that, we pretty much end up with something like this. And that's the problem, right? And the ability of data to help us understand those people has never been more prevalent, and now never more important. So what we have the ability to do these days is take that sort of traditional way of thinking about marketing, but apply the use of data to it. So that change, though, even in the time that I've been coming to ICOM, and I've been coming to ICOM for the past five to six times that we've ran ICOM, is we started ICOM on the left-hand side with the sundial, and increasingly at this particular session, we're shifting to the right-hand side. And those changes are really, really important. And we can actually see them in all of the dialogue that we're having amongst ourselves at bars around this beautiful city, and in all of the sessions that we'll be seeing over the next two days. We're shifting out of point-in-time research and counting things to really observing people in a connected way. We're shifting out of demographics and indexes, and we're actually understanding individuals and their behavior. And we're actually shifting, and the next shift will be shifting from anonymous cookies to unique people and understanding them. And if I am Mercedes, who's the only brand advertiser on the stage, I'd rather want to talk to pre-qualified customers or not talk to those customers that I've already spoken to than simply just think about people who may have come to my website. So the idea of understanding people as people is at the core of marketing and if we are to be here and make ICOM bigger and bigger and bigger, then this community has to be much closer to everything that marketing does. And I believe that I have the best role in, if, in my agency because we've shifted from the back of the process to the front of the process to being throughout. Data is pervasive in everything that an agency does these days and everything that a marketer does these days. Yet, 
this sort of circle, which we, which we could have drawn right, over the past six years or 20 years, is becoming more and more complex. The ability, the ability to connect views of people as they live their lives, both online and offline, is the challenge that we'll be hearing about this morning and the ways people are solving those challenges. The ability to make that shift, as Harvey su suggests, out of channel plans to audience plans means that we can use that data to identify what those people look like and then describe them better. But then we can actually find them. We can find those circles of people who want to buy tomato paste, as the example that we heard before, or those people who are avid gaming fans. We can now start to do that. And then we can apply sophisticated analytics at that level of people rather than at overall aggregates to understand them better and then to close that loop. Because every time we meet those people as a brand in the real world, we create new data. So this sort of circle now becomes more and more important, but actually more and more realizable because it's connected. These things actually work all the way around. Yet some of those challenges still exist, and we'll be hearing about this over the next couple of days. If I am a brand marketer on one side of a river, and I see my customer on the other side of the river, and I want to buy it, build a bridge, it's actually very, very difficult these days to connect all of that data, even in the digital world. The, con the combination of connecting desktop-based cookies with apps on your mobile device where cookies don't exist and television in a household with a set-top box means that it's really difficult to connect them. Yet this is same what, still one person. And actually, if we have cookies on a desktop, a mobile device, or we see, we see people in a mobile device and potentially on a tablet, that actually would suggest that we see three people when there's only one person. And that's a problem. So we're starting to get into this situation where although the promise of understanding people and the promise of connecting in that circular way are real inside this particular room, the challenges in order to get there are very, very difficult indeed. And the gaps in the way that brands meet people, even in this data-driven way, still exist. So I set up the drama, so I hope to bring some hope, right? I guess um, the way that we are looking at that is we're starting to think about the areas of people's lives where we can start to identify them more and more interestingly and completely when we're building that bridge between a brand and a, and a customer. So we have started to try to think about the unique identifier of people in both an on and offline way, and that unique identifier will be their mobile device. Because they carry their mobile device everywhere, it spans on and offline worlds, and increasingly, your ability to understand people and their location, where they've been physically and in, in the digital world, and the things that they're looking for and the intent for them, all are stored within this single place. So registration data on a mobile device is a much more interesting understanding, connecting point of a person than a cookie, particularly as those cookies are not persistent. They die pretty quickly. They're difficult to connect. Yet, at the same time, one of the biggest challenges that we find is that even with Verizon in the US, where we are starting with 160 million mobile IDs, we, still we are still challenged with scale, and scale on a global basis. So the two things that we start to need to think about is, one, can we understand those people quickly, and can we refresh that data in an ongoing way to close that loop? But secondly, can we enrich that view of people using different data that may be collected, that doesn't move as quickly, that isn't around location? And we set up a relationship with our partners here at Axiom 
in order to enrich those profiles so that we can tie them back to real people using an email address. We understand their gender, their age, the shopping habits, their credit card usage. So all of a sudden, we're starting to connect these interesting worlds of physical and digital, not around an, a, an anonymous cookie, but a real person with a real identifier. And actually, this is how we're starting to think about marketing today, thinking about marketing around people. So for us, we really have to think then about how we start to try to deliver messaging. How we think about people in both a world where they're using multiple screens all of the time. And actually, people don't experience marketing in individual silos. We heard all about that yesterday, and there were some fantastic presentations. So when you think about defining your audience around a unique identifier that actually is very specific to them, not simply where they've been and what we, don't, what we know about them, then you can start to try to message in a way that is unique to them. And actually, we all understand that when we're given something that we think is personal to us, we tend to value it a lot more. So in this particular example, and this is a US automotive example, we saw all of the metrics increase. And those metrics aren't simply the metrics of behavior in an online way. They're true, be they're true behavioral metrics around um, purchase intent, brand behavior, and brand favorability. So for this particular example for automotive in the US, we basically took that data, understood that person in a real smart way, and then targeted those people by their location in order to drive these fantastic results across desktop and mobile. So my time is ended here, but I want to leave you with three people, for three things. First of all, cookies are not people. Marketing begins with people. That is our first challenge. Secondly, we believe that the device ID allows us to create consistent views of those people. And thirdly, that level of personalization in marketing drives incremental benefit. Thank you. Right, we finally got there. Thank you for bearing with us. So, um, no surprises in terms of how we want to tackle this, but it really does come down to being about people. Um, as Steve was saying right now, uh, there's obviously a, a journey around how do you move away from just really thinking about an audience based upon a cookie. Um, but there's some challenges with all of this as well, along with this, right? So, I think the way that data has been collected over a, a period of time has been relatively siloed. Um, technology businesses have, have been part of that. Um, we, we ran a study fairly recently where we asked many of our clients and many of our partners um, typically how many technology platforms they'd invested in. So there was a lot of conversation around attribution platforms and technology to support that. There was lots of technologies based upon collecting data at browser level. We looked at mobile level data as well. There's just some examples within all this. You then throw in something like points of sale data, for instance, and it becomes quite murky. Um, as Steve was saying, this really does that come down to creating that persistent ID. So device ID is obviously very, very strong for, for obvious reasons. As consumers, we're always on our mobile phones. However, there's a lot more intelligence and insights to be gleaned by pulling together totality of data around a consumer. So our organization has laid down a, a framework whereby we're allowing brands to collect data wherever a consumer is going to engage with you. So really making that transformational change to saying, my consumer is going to have specific preferences about the media they want to consume, the brand, the proposition, how do I actually architect around that? It's quite difficult, right? And it's definitely a journey that everybody needs to go on. So I'm going to hand over to Brian, our, our partner at Digitas, who's going to talk about some of the use cases for this as well. Because otherwise, it comes down to the, the utility of a, a big data question. What are you going to do with all of this data? Thank you, Neil. That accent is amazing, right? And no matter what he says, it's going to sound utterly brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's to the stupid American with his notes. So I will uh, 
I'll try and keep this going. Um, thank you. So, for agencies and brands, holistic data and persistent ID should be at the core of strategy, media, and ultimately our approach to activation. It must be circular or always on to ultimately best inform each area. Data must drive this strategy. It must inform our media and ultimately our placement or this activation. It must be a continuous circle as we spoke to earlier. An ever flowing circular loop of data and insights that informs our strategy, our media, media mix, and ultimately the placement or activation of said media. At Digitas, this is the foundation of our approach, ultimately having a central nervous system geared towards person-level engagement based on consumer behaviors and marrying this up to activation versus the other way around, which is how most people are activating on this today, is fundamental to our success. Relationships with innovative, flexible technology partners like Signal help bring this approach and this vision ultimately to fruition. As all aspects of lives have become digital, and take your pictures, this is a great slide. Um, as all aspects of our lives have become digital, we have an increasing ability to understand and affect their behavior. Today, the individual is the point of service delivery. One person across many media. We, need, we can now focus on shaping the behavior, orchestrating the interplay between brand communications to create a connected experience that's a pathway to deeper brand relationships. The ability to consolidate, intake, normalize, and marry disparate data sets in real time to a holistic and persistent identity is very difficult. For us, it's the fuel that ultimately will power our decisioning engine. Our decisioning engine mines massive, powered by partners like Signal, amplified by, with partners like Axiom, right? We can now, we mine this first party data as we speak, spoke to. We run it up against, marrying against first party data attributes to create real time behavioral person level intelligence and ultimately targeting at scale. We use that knowledge to activate strategies that achieve awareness, trial, loyalty, and ultimately growth. We aren't bound to specific channels or agendas, only the data. Everything we do is guided by it. A partner like Signal, who is media and data agnostic, is central to delivering on this vision. It empowers us as an agency, yourselves as agencies and brands, to ultimately bring your own data, or BYOD, to any and all activation and analytics platforms. The ability to be flexible and plug in or unplug your data at any point in time, whenever and wherever you want, is imperative to brands and agencies in this ever-evolving ad tech ecosystem. At Digitas, we're building a foundation for people-based marketing across devices, targeting people in a cookie-less world, right? We've all been talking about this and we're gonna to continue to talk about it. It's very hard to do. Ultimately, we want to be able to decision and message these people across paid, earned, and owned channels. Where accurate audience targeting and speed to market is required to ultimately lower the cost of customer acquisition and scale sales. Every action we take or don't take will be informed by persistent ID, holistic ID, housed and honed in a central nervous system that grows and learns over time. This system is built across disparate marketing touch points, including actions taken on site and in store. Signal has the ability to integrate at the point of sale 
and the opportunity to inform our segmentation in near real time, which is extremely powerful. The ability to close the loop with segment and inform our segmentation by ID suppression is imperative to improving our efficiency and efficacy of activation and our marketing efforts. ID suppression is probably one of the quickest ways to update our segments and ultimately permit the economics of these technology stacks that we've built to work. We currently have a client where 93% of sales still occur in store, but they're one of the largest digital spenders in the marketplace. Informing our media tactics and segmentation with near real-time updates based on in-store purchases provides a more relevant and optimal experience to our customers and our prospects. We talked about it ad nauseum and we're gonna to continue to throughout these next couple of days and years, right? The ability to identify behavior with real-time intent signals across devices and channels tied to a single user is the foundation of our approach, of all of our approaches. Creating the clean, holistic data set that is persistent is one of the most important and most difficult parts of our jobs. Ensuring it's flexible, platform agnostic is equally important and equally as difficult. Data is the fuel for our decisioning center that ultimately delivers activation of the long discussed, and I'm gonna say it guys, I'm gonna say it, but rarely delivered on, right message, right time, right place. And I think that was kind of utterly brilliant too. Thanks, Brian. So let's think about the overall summary of all of this. So we keep saying about leveraging a persistent ID, um, creating that holistic view of the customer to real, inform the real-time activation side of things. Um, we talk about that foundational capability, and those sort of things don't happen overnight, but it's making those strategic investments and prioritization against some specific use cases against it. We're thinking about the way that we can provide better data to improve segmentation, and ultimately that, that's the role of an organization like ourselves with, with our partners within all of this. Steve was talking about earlier on about amplifying that audience at scale. So obviously there's a lot of conversation here around first party data, and I noticed some sessions later on today to talk about that, but how do you get that right blend from a, a micro level segment versus the macro level objective over a period of time? Um, ultimately, how do you inform decisioning and activation? And really thinking about that in the terms of actually doing it at the right time. So it's all great that you can bring all of this data together, you can think about specific objectives, but if you can't connect with that consumer when they're in market for a service or product, then it's just a total waste of time. So I think it was great to hear from Brian around some of the examples and use cases they've got. Um, thank you all very much for your time and I'm gonna hand back to Mercedes. So we have some, a couple of minutes just to talk and, and make questions. So any question from the audience as of now? We have one question over here. Thank you, great presentations. I'm wondering for the activation, is this purely for retention marketing or having a persistent ID and tracking all this activity, is there a way to use this for acquisition marketing, especially with privacy concerns? Is that? Yeah. Uh, great question. So it, it's, it's for both, right? Um, the first party and persistent ID is for retention, deepening, et cetera, right? We will amplify with second and third party data sources in a safe environment, right? And activate on in that manner. But no, no you're correct, right? We, there are privacy concerns that we all have to follow. Um, and so that first party CRM data is leveraged for retention, deepening, lookalike modeling. We create propensity models and marry that up to second and third party data opportunities to drive more prospects now. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another question over here. Can we share the, the mic? Thank you. Hello, I'm Geneviève Petit from Petit Web in Paris. Uh, what strikes me for the next uh, two days, uh, the previous two days, is that you never speak of uh, consumer permission. 
and all is based on the consumer's permission. And I'm not sure he would allow you to make all these things. Uh, I think this sort of connects back into Brian's point. Naturally, um, when you start thinking about this level of enhanced targeting, you do that in a, in a privacy safe way. But increasingly, if you think about the, the role that brands play in people's lives, the, um, the, the value exchange between a brand and what it delivers to a person becomes increasingly important. So if a brand can create unparalleled access, deliver information or entertainment or um, some sort of social currency that they can share with their friends that um, uh, makes them feel better, then increasingly you're seeing that people will actually opt in for that particular access and that particular exchange of value. So for sure, I think that um, there are natural privacy concerns, but fundamentally I, I tend to agree and but sort of tend to disagree that people themselves are, are prepared to give away access to their personal information in return for something of value to them. And it's really the, the, the smartest brands on the planet that are acknowledging that and then taking advantage of that, you know, and delivering service to people that's beyond just pushing their product and selling product benefits. Any other question from the audience for now? So, um I would like to just keep talking. We had actually breakfast earlier, and, and we were talking about two challenges in data activation. And one of that was actually the cost benefit, right? We, we know that all this modeling, all this data gathering, getting all these different sets of information together costs a lot of money and a lot of time. So can you guys talk a little bit more about scale and, and cost benefit? Yeah, um, it was quite interesting when we were talking about this at breakfast as well. It's, um, very much the, the, the conversation around BAU activity. So you've got a program of events into play already, but do you want to strategically hive off a, a group of people to start building out the, the business case to move to this model? Um, or does this become the, the new norm? And, and obviously we'll shift towards the new norm. But right now you've obviously got a, a committed level of spend, whether that's from a media perspective, whether that's from a technology perspective, and, and how do you actually build out the, the right models around all of that? Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind with all of this, again, is there's that common denominator around people and talent investment that overrides a lot of these things as well. So I, I think we all get the, the theory behind connecting a lot of data around consumers, um, but right now there's still a, a question mark about the scalability of some of these programs. So it's kind of about what's the, the step change and the model that you need to go to to economically prove all of this out. Yeah, I sort of build on this. I guess that... Um, there's a long road and a lot of people between a business challenge and a marketing plan landing with somebody. And at the point where the costs outweigh the benefit, then we shouldn't be doing that. And we've, we've actually always lived by that maxim right? as, as, as an industry and as a group of marketers. I think um, the more that we introduce cost in order to try to get closer to people, then we need to try to drive even further incremental benefit. So um, I sort of pick up on the question that we had early this morning, which was how come we're seeing more and more increases in ROI um, the more that we are starting to try to um, activate in digital campaigns over the last couple of days? Well, fundamentally, we're getting closer to people as marketers. We're, we're providing them value, and we're not simply selling messages in a very arbitrary fashion. So costs must um, be overshadowed by the benefits that they deliver to the bottom line as an organization. Thank you. And uh, now the other, the other challenge that we were talking about is data ownership, right? And, and this concept about, okay, if I give my, my company's data to, to these uh, strategies and buying methods, am I putting some value at risk? And how does that play for a brand? And also how does that play for you as a, as a providers or partners, and how do you handle that? Um, for ourselves, it was uh, finding partners that aren't necessarily tied to media or data in general. Um, someone like a Signal, right, who is uh, completely agnostic in that marketplace, 
permits and grants ownership of that data to, e to the brand, right? Uh, and I spoke about the flexibility to be able to plug in or unplug your data at any point in time to deliver it to a specific uh, maybe uh, media DMP, DSP combo, et cetera. Uh, that's very important, but that ability to, again, be flexible and be agnostic in the marketplace is very important. So you do ultimately own the data, and it is also on the brands and the agencies to ensure that the brands are making the right decisions yeah. and that their data is flexible, that it does not become um, in a walled garden or centralized hub that they can't take and go and bring with them. Yeah, I'd say that all data isn't created equally. You know, if, if I am a bank, um, and Mercedes, you work for one, you know, the biggest bank in Mexico, I think the first thing that you should be doing when you're thinking about marketing is ensuring that you're identifying qualified people, either current customers or not current customers, and trying to, trying to meet them in the best environment. Fundamentally, um, that said, I don't expect um, you as a bank to share your, your personal, the, the data on your customers to agencies or partners even in that respect. I think our role as an agency team is basically to help you find those people and integrate information across these various platforms that have all of their own unique IDs and then ensure that we can deliver you the best places and spaces where your customers or potential customers can meet your brand. Um, I don't believe that anybody in this particular room or anyone in, in the overall ecosystem of players has a divine right to hold all of the data. So our ability to share data and information seamlessly across um, all of the partnerships in order to try to meet the client's objectives is the number one priority. Great, thank you. Uh, so any, there we have a couple of questions over here, so can you help me with the mic? It's coming over there. I knew I should have sat on the edge. <laughs> Hi, I'm George Ivey with the MRC in the US. I have a quick question about this. Um, do you, how much effort do you guys spend when you're trying to link and do all this activation with these profiles that you're developing on the accuracy of them? Like if you're using Axiom to help enrich and attribute data, we know that those data points aren't always perfect and you might be thinking that you're activating somebody and then, because we've actually seen this when we've done testing, you think this might, and I'm not, I'm going to use age and gender, but I know it's a bigger issue than that, that you might think you're dealing with somebody of a certain age and gender, and then come to find out that's not actually who they are. Mm -hmm. um, do you look at that, or do you just rely on, let's say, sales lift, something works or it doesn't work, and that sort of tells you whether you're going down the right path? Or you don't just really worry about that at all and you just look at whether there's incremental benefit. Do you, do you understand? Do you? It's a fantastic question. Um, I, I guess that there's a couple of ways to look at that. First of all, look, you're, you're asking the question of verified data versus reported data in some respects. Um, we, we spent some time yesterday talking about what's the benefit of doing something versus not. So th that obviously plays a part within that to some of the comments that you've just made. I guess the, the way that we're working with clients is to first of all make it about that first party data and making sure that there's 100% matching of those identities around who those consumers are so you've got that level of certainty and control essentially around who you're going to be targeting. However, to really amplify that out, you are going to be relying upon third party data as well. So it comes down to a, a point of view in terms of what the overall objective is going to be and how you want to kind of blend all of that together. Um, I, I guess, look, a, a key thing within all of this as well is looking from a, an NPS perspective as well around consumer data flowing that into the mix. Thinking about the, the actual campaign metrics that are involved in this as well is going to be a good indication. Um, and to a point earlier on around privacy as well and the control and governance from the consumer um, is getting that blend all together. So look, it, it is quite complex, right? Anything? No, I think if we pick up on the on the overriding metrics idea I think is interesting here. So for sure, um, bottom line sales shift and profitability is priority one for, for all brand advertisers. Yet at the same time, 
your, abil your, your ability to create control over that is really about the people that you're shifting behavioral change with, whether that be a call to action for them to buy something or a change in attitudinal behavior around their brand. So I sort of come back to the idea that just because you're working in this environment where there's more and more data, it doesn't mean that you collect everything and count it all. You, know, you sort of have to think to yourselves, what are, the, what are the bottom line objectives of my particular overall marketing program? What sort of shifts in behavior am I looking at around people? And then how am I going to achieve that shift? And sort of connect the dots in that way. Um, yeah, I, I do believe that we have a, an, an increasing ability to understand people a lot more than we ever had done in the past because we were measuring channel and then shift in sales. Now we're sort of thinking to ourselves, okay, what behavioral change are we looking? How does the channel make that shift? And then what's the resulting impact? So that layer of understanding people and the sort of underlying theme of both presentations today, and I think the underlying theme of today, will be you know, how can we shift people's behavior in order to meet bottom line objectives of brand advertisers? And uh, just going to, back to, to George's question, we were talking this morning that suddenly this looks more like direct mail 15 years ago. And, and, and suddenly in the digital world, we are trying to bridge that gap, right? So it's similar to what we used to do in direct mail with the, with the credit card offers, right? We used the data, our own data, the data from Axiom. We created models and we tried to find the right people and giving them that right credit and the right offer. Not all the time, right? And not, not for the, that single guys, but it's getting better and better. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you in a sec. Uh, the, the only question here is, how do you interact on in this world? I, I see this bridge doing offline, online thing, but c can you guys talk more about how are you trying to do that and integrating those channels? Now that you are having this integrated person, how do you do that with integrated channels? Uh, it's hard, <laughs> uh, but we do it, or we try. It boils down to multiple partnerships, um, integration at the point of sale to inform segmentation in near real time like we spoke of. It, it boils down to some t uh, potential MTA or multi-touch attribution partnership that can track and inform digital with offline. Uh, it's the, the major problem is the connectivity or the time to connectivity of that offline to online. Uh, and I think we're getting better at it. We're not there yet. Uh, point of sale, because there is technology at the core of it, help is, is probably one of the easier. But direct mail touch points, et cetera, um, you know, that's, it becomes more difficult. But, but we're getting there. Yeah, I don't want to lose the question and, and in the interest of time. I actually believe that. Um, it's the use of that data and its application which is most important. So the concepts of channel and content are sort of inseparable now. If you separate content from channel, then channel just becomes a dumb pipe. So our ability to use that information in an end-to-end -end fashion in the marketing process becomes the most important thing. And you don't need sophisticated models to do that. We build sophisticated models, but actually getting people using the same source of truth is probably even more stronger than the sophisticated algorithm. So we have one last question, can we? Okay. Just, uh, yeah. Quick, 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 quick question. Uh, very quick question. Uh, I'm not sure it's quick. I'll ask it, maybe we'll <laughs> answer it later in the day. But I'm wondering if we're talking about the math men outrunning the mad men. So, Brian, your comment was rarely delivered the right offer to the right person at the right time. And Steve, you put up a picture that said, to most consumers, it still feels like mass marketing. And so we have the ability to target someone, but are we simply getting more and more efficient? And are we losing effectiveness? Which is to say, if we start with the consumer, are we actually, most consumers I talk to say, I don't feel like you're delivering relevant messages to me. We're better at targeting, but we're not better at delivering the right message. And is, so what does it take for the capabilities we're talking about to translate into consumers saying, actually, this is more of what I want. This feels like you're talking to me versus, versus everybody. Your picture, Steve. We need an answer quicker than the question. Uh, we're out of time. I, I would answer with the same answer I gave back. You know, the concept of channel and content 
are the same, one and the same thing, and the application of data to deliver both channel and content in a real-time way that is unique to you is the most important thing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thanks a lot, folks. Really appreciate it.